I'm going to hand over to Gary. Gary, all yours, ladies and gents. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, yeah, I think what uh, the topic for today that uh, we were going to discuss is uh, protecting your wealth uh, and building your wealth in market volatility. So that's sort of the the idea that we we. we building all the, the basis from. And I, I think I sat, I sat down to think about it after being given the topic and, and thought, and I started thinking about it more like a fund manager and as if I was going to talk to fund managers. So I, I've tried to just break the beginning down into what is volatility? What does it mean for people, um, you know, regular investors rather than, uh, you know, maybe a fund management house that we'd normally talk to? So the first thing I want to do is just go through like understanding what is volatility. And I'm sure if you've got a broker, you probably chatted to them recently and they said, oh, this first quarter has been very volatile. Your returns have been all over the place. But what, what is actually volatility? So volatility is basically, I mean, there's a, a lot of different ways that you can measure it. So you can measure it through beta, you can measure it through standard deviation. Um, but basically what volatility is, it's the amount of movement or, or the unpredictability of the return on an investment. So you can see, obviously, the red, the red graph there is very volatile, the, the black graph not so volatile. Um, obviously, the higher the volatility, the higher the risk associated with, uh, with the stock. Now, as I said, there's a lot of different ways of measuring volatility. So, you, And obviously, what, what's happened in the, in the first three uh, Three months of this year, I mean, we've seen a, a spike indefinitely in local volatility. So, one of the, the ways that uh, I suppose traders, financial market professionals look at look at volatility is is through volatility indices. So, I've just got here. This is the uh, the Savvy and the and the VIX. So, the, the the Savvy is the South African Volatility Index, and the the VIX is uh, the Chicago uh, Board Options Exchange uh, Index of Volatility. So, um, you can see that one's in in pink. Now, you can see they track very closely, obviously, because our market very, is very driven by, by offshore factors. But what you can see sort of towards the end over here is you've actually seen, you know, the South African market volatility has definitely elevated relative to, uh, to even, even to, you know, developed market uh, volatility. And you can see that's most likely the S&P that's been rising recently. I mean, they're just off uh, 2016 highs. South African market been a little bit, bit, bit more muted. And perhaps that's got to do maybe with our political situation. Uh, it, could be, it could be to do with a lot of different things. The way that these, these indices are, are constructed is, is very complicated. I thought that was probably outside the bounds of uh, what we're going to discuss today. I mean, you know, if we want to go into Black Scholes formula, you're welcome to give us a shout afterwards and how, how you, you develop implied volatility. But what, what volatility, what these indices does give you is, is a very good prediction of how the market's going to react in volatility going forward. Um, and it is, it is a predictive measure because it looks at volatility normally three months out. Um, and again, it's you know when you when you're looking at the option pricing formulas that that develop these indices, it's basically the supply and demand of puts and calls. So it's how much uh, how, how much protection are investors buying, and that's why the VIX has earned itself uh, the name. The it's the the fear the fear and greed index. Okay, so now we're going to look at how to avoid volatility, and uh, obviously this is okay. This is the beginning. So. Obviously, the first way of, of getting rid of volatility out of a portfolio is you just avoid volatile products. So the easiest thing to do is you just pick something with a linear payoff profile. So you can stick cash in the money market. I mean, we do money market accounts, very simple, 7.4%. Stick your money in there. Don't worry about it. And you will get uh, you know 7.4 percent at the at the end of the year. So you know a T naught, T one, what you, what your your payoff profile will be. Very very boring. <laughs> you know not going to give you anything to write home about. And of course the risk of doing something like that is that if you look at Saab, they've got in, the CPI basket sitting at about seven percent. If you believe that, you know most people here probably have very different inflation baskets to what Saab is uh, is is putting out there. So if you put your money in a money market instrument, you you might you know if, if Saab is correct, you might track, uh, track inflation, but you're not going to grow your wealth at all. Um, it's very much for a short-term type investor. If you're looking at you know, needing to withdraw your funds after one year, this is probably the right kind of product for you. Obviously, when you look at investment, I always go through the slide you know, towards the beginning of a, of a presentation just to, to understand what, what investment is all about, because it really is the crux of investment for me, an investment return. So you've obviously got, as, as you, this, is, this is sort of the, I think of it as like a production possibility frontier, but it's the investment frontier, it's the, the yield frontier. So what happens here is, uh, you know, as you obviously go up the return side of the, of the graph, you go up the risk side of the graph. The more risk you take, the more return that you're going to get. And you get various types of, uh, 
uh, asset, the asset classes change as you go up the, the risk reward curve. Today, what we're probably going to be talking about most is uh, obviously equity investments. So we're going to look at uh, you know, stocks, uh, not really looking at bonds, that kind of thing. Uh, obviously, what we were talking about before is cash in the bank at 7%, cash under the mattress, you actually just losing money if you've got money in there. Now, we're going to talk about the next way. So just remember, here on this, this curve, that's impossible. You can't, there's no such thing as a, as a high return, low risk type, type investment. It's just, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. Um, plenty of people will tell you about them, but they're probably more sitting in this category here, which is high risk, lower return. So if we look at uh, the second way to manage volatility, the second way you manage volatility is through diversification and, and, and building a portfolio of uncorrelated assets. So what I'm talking about here really is hedge funds. So hedge funds, alternative investments, anything that isn't correlated to the overall equity market. And I just wanted to qualify this before we get into you know, stock picks and how to, how to manage a, an equity portfolio through volatility because there are ways of trading, there are ways of um, investing, yeah, there's ways of taking exposure in stocks that, that take you outside of the, the traditional relative manager's universe where you know, if the market comes down 40%, your portfolio is gonna take a 40% knock. There's many other things that you can do. Um, now, obviously, with hedge funds, hedge funds are a very glamorous thing, but uh, you know, in the past, that really has been the perception of the hedge fund. But the reality has been here, yeah, and if we go back two slides, it's, some of them have been definitely in the avoid uh, category, making fund managers rich. Obviously, with hedge funds now moving into uh, actually CIS regulation coming in now, and they're going to be regulated under the CIS, makes it a lot more attractive for a retail investor. They're going to be regulated by the FSB as well. Um, but yeah, the, the point of buying a hedge fund, something that's uncorrelated to the rest of the market, even if it is you know, dealing with equity type instruments, is that uh, you're trying to get you're not trying to get away from the risk reward relationship. You're not trying to get more reward for less risk. You're trying to you're trying to get a diversified asset, so it'll still sit on that frontier. But when you know your equity portfolio comes down, this is the kind of product that won't come down. Um, if you, again, this is not really what we're going to go through in the rest of the presentation. But if you guys want to chat about it, we do a lot of trading kind of products as well. So the, probably the method that, that is most important to anyone who has an equity portfolio is, is just the keep calm and carry on investing. Volatility, I mean, volatility has almost become synonymous with, with sell-off. Um, you know, when sell-off, oh, this market is incredibly volatile. They're not looking at the, the variability of the prediction. They're just saying because the market's coming down, it's volatile. Um, but yeah, essentially, if you have a time horizon, I would say of less than, the, you know, if your time horizon is over two years, volatility is your best friend. Because this is the time where you can buy more stock. You can allocate more of your portfolio to, to equity investments. You're going to get in at better prices. And it's essentially just the market on sale. The, the market is cheap. If you've got a time horizon of over two years, that will, that will come right for you eventually. I mean, you know, again, as long as you're diversifying, you have uncorrelated assets in your portfolio, you really don't need to worry about volatility. You don't need to worry about that next 40% correction because if it does correct, you know, you, you buy more. You allocate a little bit more capital towards your, your equity investment. You should have a diversified basket, basket across uh, a lot of different asset classes anyway. And it, it really is an opportunity. I mean, we obviously have been taking a lot of opportunity recently. I mean, we've really been, been, been upping some, some weightings in stocks. But I mean, this is, this is a chart that we also do. I mean, you know, this is, this is the, just the, the top 40 over the last year, since 1996. And it's actually incredible. I mean, you remember that crash that we had in 2008, and it was the end of the world, worst financial crisis you can possibly imagine. We're never going to recover. The whole world is broken. I mean, that was a 42% dip in equity markets. If you had invested at the worst possible time, if you had gone into the equity market and, and, and put all your money in at absolutely the worst possible time, you know, within two years, you would have been flat, and uh, three years, you would have really been positive on your investment. So the panic around volatility really is, uh, you know, if you can hold on, that's, that's really the point. Um, if you go back to 2000, uh, yeah, 2002, 2003, I mean, can you believe a 37% dip in the market there? If you go back to 1998, a 44% dip. I mean, literally the same size market drawdowns as, it, uh, as we got in 2008. And, and you can see you bought at the worst point in, 2000, in 1998. You're way higher than that now. So really, you know, we're going to talk about timing the market now, and we're going to talk about you know, how to build a proper equity portfolio and how to take advantage of volatility. But really, you know, before we get bogged down in those sorts of things, I just wanted to make the point that being in the market is far more important than, than, picking, you know, than really just tweaking your portfolio mix. Um, I'd rather someone had uh, you know, a, a diversified basket of top 40 stocks uh, in a market crash than not have one at all. 
Okay, so this, okay, I'm not going to go through this, but this is essentially, so, I mean, we were chatting beforehand uh, to someone, and, and uh, that's, that's the detailed version, and I encourage you to go through it in some detail when you, uh, when, when you go through the slides afterwards. But uh, essentially, this is the point of the market. I mean, you want to buy low and sell high, but what inevitably happens is the market is up here because everyone is buying. And that's, that's where you get into the euphoric state, and the market goes up. Um, everyone wants to buy and it collapses and then you, you know, everyone's afraid. Everyone's telling you to sell. I mean, go and watch all the market commentators from, from January this year. No, this market is broken. It's never going to come right. Sell, head for the hills. We, we're 100% in cash now. That's, that's sort of what you're hearing in the media. That's what you're hearing from everyone you speak to. A good broker should be on the other side. And, you know, that's when we become psychologists instead of stockbrokers. And you're sitting there, just buy more. No, you're crazy. And, and, and it is. I mean, that's, that's essentially what you should be using your broker for almost as a sounding board, but I mean, we go through the same emotions that the, the rest of the market uh, goes through as well. Okay, so now that we've looked at the, the ways of managing the volatility and how you should look at volatility, um, let's look, look at what's working for us in, in the global sense. So what we've done on our portfolios, and I mean, we, we manage uh, sort of equ uh, you know, model equity portfolios, um, we really started de-risking the portfolio towards the end of last year. So it was about uh, October, November last year. We, we've always backed momentum. So we've been very focused on, you know, we don't care if the, the stock is trading at a very high PE, as long as it's got earnings momentum, uh, you know, it's got uh, increasing revenue, we'll still go into it. If there's a story, if people are buying the stock, we're willing to go in and ride it higher. But at the same time, you've got to take cognizance of what's going on around you. So there will always be doomsayers. So, I mean, I've got a whole lot of quotes there. I mean, when Royal Bank of Scotland came out in January and said, you know, sell everything, you know, in a, in a, in a crowded hall, you know, exits, exit doors are small. I mean, that, that, <laughs> that's, I think, when the bottom just fell out of the market uh, in January. But, uh, I mean, there has been a lot of stress in, in, in the markets recently. So, I mean, we've had huge fears of, of China slowing down. We've had the oil price collapsing, which is a very fundamentally driven story around the you know the, the breaking down of the OPEC cartel um, obviously we've got the, the meeting on on uh, Sunday now which is going to definitely provide some clarity whether they're going to fix um, you know freeze output at January's prices um, we've also got obviously you know the stresses in the eurozone and the eurozone you know, debt crisis seems to flare up every couple of years the, the world you know the world is growing the IMF is also warning that that global growth will be relatively flat um, and these, these are stress signs that, that you've got to take cognizance of. And it's, it's really, you know, it's a move that we started identifying in the data probably, like I said, we, we started acting on it probably, uh, you know, between October and November, we started de-risking our portfolios. But even before that, we could see there was definitely a shift. There's been a shift out of those momentum, high growth, buy at any, at any price as long as it's going up type stocks into much more of a value type approach. Um, if we go... One step forward, yeah. So this is this is these, these are the kind of things we're looking. At. We, what we're saying is essentially, don't stick your head in the sand. I mean, yes, markets will go up over time. Yes, you, uh, you know, if you have a two-year time horizon, it doesn't really matter what you buy. You will make money if you if you stay invested. Um, but uh, you know, at the same time, you've got to you've got to take cognizance of of the stresses in the market. I mean, markets can trend sideways for a long time, and there are better places sometimes to allocate capital. And different kinds of stocks will outperform. So as I said, I put I put a couple of flags of things that we are looking at and and and, and issues that we're considering. But if I, if I just do one slide, which is uh, sort of the, our our view of the world in a nutshell. So in the U.S., I mean, the U.S., you know, there's a very divergent uh, monetary policy in the world at the moment. The U.S. is obviously going into a rate hiking cycle. Uh, and the question really is, is the GDP growth, uh, is inflation, is inflation growing in the U.S.? Is GDP growth strong enough to actually warrant uh, starting to hike interest rates in the U.S.? Um, you know, if you look at, we've just started the U.S. earnings season, uh, you know, a couple of days ago with Alcoa. We had J.P. Morgan reporting last night. And what, what were, the, I mean, this is the first time JP Morgan has reported since, since a Fed rate hike, since the Fed, the, the first Fed rate hike. It's one of the first big US banks to report. I mean, banks essentially get a lift from a rate hike, but JP Morgan declining earnings, declining uh, revenue as well, but better than analyst estimates. Because look, if you look at the analyst consensus forecasts, people are very worried about what's going on in, in, in corporate America. Um, that said, you know, where else do you want to allocate your capital at this stage? I mean, you've got a very strong dollar environment. Part of this is because of the divergence between the, the monetary policy in the EU and the, and, the, and the monetary policy in the US. And because of that, we've had a, <clears throat> a dramatically strengthening dollar. 
Um, we've obviously had Mario Draghi coming out this year as well. Um, you know, and he's easing his finger onto the bazooka. He did say in, in his statement, this is the end. There's no more stimulus coming out of the ECB. Um, and sort of, you guys must get yourselves right, uh, or and, and this is the end. I mean, markets, you know, it took it mixed. It's always difficult to, to interpret how a market uh, sees a, a central bank announcement. But definitely the Eurozone, still very, very loose monetary policy in the Eurozone. And uh, and yeah, we are seeing growth, uh, growth in corporate earnings as well. Well. And we move across to China. We remember in the first quarter, I mean, China was every, every, China was the word on everyone's lips. Stock markets are imploding. Um, you know, I, I, we, I mean, I remember chatting to so many analysts and trying to work out how the Chinese market was going to translate into a, a slowdown in the actual real underlying Chinese economy. And no one could give me a straight answer on that. So I mean, we, we took the view that, uh, you know, this, this potentially is, is a transitory thing. It's a, a young stock market. It's a very retail-driven stock market. Um, and we took the view that maybe this is the time to start start looking at, uh, you know, so some sort of, uh, you know, Chinese exposure. There's the various ETFs that you can use to get exposure there. There's different companies that you can buy. I mean, we're still very bullish on NASPAS uh, and, and its move into China. And we look at it just because of the, the, the Chinese demographic dividend that's going to, going to come through. At the moment, uh, it's about 300 million people in the Chinese middle class. By 20, I think it's by 2022, the forecast is that to double. So a huge amount of new people. I mean, that's the size of the US economy, essentially going into the middle class in China. I mean, it's, it's an enormous country with enormous potential. But, um, you know, obviously gets a, a, at the moment, everyone very concerned about the slowdown. But at the same time, I mean, China growing at 6.5%, even 6%, for the size of the economy is not, for me, a place where you should be exiting, you know, in droves. Yes, the stock market became overheated. Yes, they have infl inflation problems in, uh, in food prices especially. I mean, in, in the latest uh, inflation print, we saw especially pork and veg, you know, increasing, you know, inflation there quite quite dramatic um, but overall the the economy has has a long way to go and there's a lot of value to be unlocked there I, I still believe okay if we look at it so just to quickly go back to fed rate hikes you know looking at it I mean there is a divergence uh, policy uh, in, in the the US and in Europe but if you look at if you look at the US scenario I mean it's also it's been my view for a long time that the interest rate hiking cycle is going to be very very gradual if you look at the amount of debt in the US they can't afford to hike too quickly you know the rest of the world is stimulating I mean when when I, I, I didn't believe I mean you, you guys the guys that have watched me on TV will have known I was saying there's going to be no rate hike in in December I was wrong but uh, then it was predictive. If you look at the, the Janet Yellen dot plot, there was going to be four more rate hikes in, in the US. We just didn't see that as possible. I mean, now there's a, there's a wonderful tool. You can get it on CME um, that just gives you the probability of the, the US rate hike and when it's going to come out. So you can see by 2017, and now remember the dot plot from, from Janet Yellen was going to be four rate hikes in, in, 20, in 2016. Um, the market's now pricing in potentially one. So it's a 37% chance we'll have one rate hike from the US, uh, one uh, 25 basis point rate hike by the, um, by the February meeting next in 2017, and a 41% chance that it will remain flat. Our view is that it probably will remain flat. I think they're going to find it very, very difficult to continue a rate hiking cycle. Already, they almost you, you feel they're almost looking for excuses. You know, you, you listen to the FOMC minutes, and they look around, they go, oh, but it's the global problems. You know, there's always going to be global problems. Like, that, for me, is just an excuse. Um, and they, and I don't think I don't think that they have the ability, and they don't need to. The, the inflation isn't at their two percent target. It's not a limit. It's a target in the U.S. Um, so I still think there's there's there's, a, there's going to be looser monetary policy in the U.S. Perhaps looser than than people are expecting, um, which should be good for stocks. Um, now, obviously, you know, we've felt it. I mean, we've talked about uh, the currency, but the, the political situation in South Africa has uh, got everyone, you know, throwing their toys out of their cart and saying, you know, it's all, it's all finished. I mean, that's why the RAND's at 16. But a, a lot of this has actually got to do with a, very much a switchover between the, the emerging market and developed market, um, you know, trade flows. So if you look at it, this is just a, it's a relative graph between the MSCI emerging markets uh, equity index and the developed market index. And you can see, so that basically takes emerging markets markets uh, divided by, um, you know, developed markets. And you can see that the trend is, is, is almost straight down there. There's been a huge flow of capital out of the emerging markets into developed markets. We have had a tick up recently. So just this is the, the, the first quarter of 2016. And you can see, and you can feel it. The RAND suddenly strengthening again. The, um, you know, commodity prices are lifting. People are getting a little bit more bullish about China. But the trend has definitely been away from emerging markets recently. And part of that has to do with a, a two-year story of, of, of the Fed 
and uh, starting to hike interest rates as people move back in. From our point of view, I mean, that's a standard deviation there. You know, you, you might get some more emerging market strength, but for me, the trend is still very clear there. I, th I think that uh, there's still a lot of opportunity in the developed, in the developed world. Um, and, you know, pockets of value here, but you need to be careful about going, you know, wildly overweight South African companies. Um, I mean, I was chatting to Hebron Smith uh, the other night from NRG, and you know, he, I mean, he's the ultimate value manager, and he was saying, you know, he's got PPP on the rand at 11, I think it's 1180, and we will get back there, and it'll probably trade at a premium, and and that's, I don't see it. I'm sorry, like we we've got very divergent uh, divergent views on that, and uh, again, I think you know the currency strength that we're seeing here is partly, partly seasonal. Um, a lot of the resource rally that we've seen here, if you look at the short interest on the resource counters, especially something like Anglo American Kumba definitely decreasing and that uh, you know and that also uh, you know def definitely helping with the balance looking like a short squeeze and um, yeah and, and and start and, and the fact that this uh, for me I think this can collapse I think it's a little bit soon to you know throw caution to the wind and start buying buying into these resource companies okay so if we look at the, the thing I've talked a little bit about U US uh, uh, policy divergence already um, okay so the rising the rising uh, US interest rates and strengthening dollar so what does this mean what does this mean for portfolios how does that help us to position portfolios okay we, we still think that the dollar the dollar strength is going to continue you've seen a, a little bit of an unwinding here um, but like I said from that chart before I think I think you are going to see a continuation and I do think that you're going to see that US dollar continue to strengthen so when we look at offshore companies we're definitely looking at companies that have exposure within the US borders, um, you know, people that are, are servicing customers and aren't reliant on, on, on the stronger dollar uh, to make profit. Uh, weaker consumer prices, weaker commodity prices. Um, again, we've seen commodity prices starting to lift here. Some of, some of the, the consumer stocks have come off on the back of this. But the, the real beneficiary from a, a lower commodity prices across the world, lower oil prices, lower steel prices, is, is eventually going to be the consumer. It's more money in their pocket. Um, and it also, yeah, it, it, it will help to stimulate those economies. Um, again, you know, European and Asian central banks still in a very accommodative mode, um, but definitely still uncertainty. So as you see the move towards, uh, you know, the, these more unconventional uh, central bank measures, so things like negative interest rates, we expect uncertainty to grow in the market. And because of that, we've started to shift out of very high PE stocks and go into sort of lower beta, you know, more, more not entirely value, and we're not going and buying the, you know, like... Uh, Impalas, for example, but definitely, you know, we'd be switching out of a Woolies, buying something like a Fashini instead, just because of the multiple. Um, you know, switching out of something like Kuro and buying Advertech also, just because of those those very extended sort of story stocks we think are going to come under a lot of pressure. Because for the the rest of 2016, I, I don't I don't think this volatility is going anywhere. I think we're going to be in it for a while. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and okay. So if we go, okay, again, we've talked a little bit about the Chinese stock market. <clears throat> we're also looking at, we, we take, you know, with the, with the volatility that we've seen in the currency recently, when we build a portfolio and we look at probably 20 stocks for, for any client to get optimum diversification, we definitely consider, you know, local versus offshore assets. And we try and keep the mix at about, at the moment, we're sitting at about 60, 40 offshore versus local. And that's all done through a JSE portfolio, but it's holding things like Naspas, Steinoff. Um, you're, looking, you're looking at companies that, that have assets offshore. Now, obviously, with Bidvest splitting into Bidcorp and, and Bidvest Industrial, I think it's going to make it a little bit more interesting. You can even target your exposure a little bit more accurately. <laughs> Okay, if you look at uh, local local investment themes, again, <clears throat> we've gone through, yes, the currency is strengthening at the moment, but the currency is a lot weaker than it has been. Um, if you look at that, the, the volatility in our currency, you know, for us, we need to look at stocks that, that have pricing power. I mean, you've seen, obviously, the gold miners have just taken off. I mean, with the, the gold price sort of appreciating there, you know, the, the, the rand blowing out like this, I mean, it's been absolutely, it's like put them on jet fuel. But um, where we're looking in South Africa, I mean, we're looking for companies that, that have pricing power, that have the moats, so that there, there are no substitute uh, goods available for them, and they are very entrenched in the type of, uh, with the type of customers that they work with. We are definitely, while the, U, the rest of the world might be accommodative and the U.S. is tentative on, on interest rate hikes, we are definitely in a rate hiking cycle, and this will feed through the endowment effect into the banking stocks. So we are fairly bullish on financials, even with the, the potential um, you know, ratings downgrade coming up. We think you know, when it's in the press, it's in the price, and this is certainly in the press. I mean, I think everyone is worried about it. I think the market has, take, has a good understanding of it. And, uh, I mean, for example, when Brazil, uh, you know, when Brazil finally uh, was downgraded into junk status, 
mechanism and their currency actually appreciated as well. So we still think that we are very bullish on banks and financials in an interest rate hiking cycle. We look at the, and someone was actually asking me about Zeta beforehand. We look at the drought very much as a transitory effect. Um, remember, we're looking at these stocks for you know, two years minimum and probably more. Um, yes, there, there will be some sort of uh, earnings compression for, for you know, very agri-focused stocks. But again, you go and look at their share prices. I mean, they've been absolutely pummeled. Half these stocks are down more than 50%. We think it is largely priced in. And if you are going to look at, at sort of more of the agri-stocks, it is maybe not a bad, bad time to start, start uh, accumulating there. Again, Consumer discretionary stocks is very much, you know, our offshore case. Locally, not so much. We, we see the, the South African consumer, I don't want to say it, but the South African consumer is under pressure. <laughs> and, um, and again, so instead we're looking for, for stocks that, that, you know, do more B2B sales. You know, we, we still hold retailers in our portfolio as well, but, but the heavy sort of credit-driven retailers we, we, we're trying to steer clear of. Uh, unemployment, obviously, one of the, the themes in South Africa as well. So how do we um, how, how do we actually think about buying a company? And I mean, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you that you can look at a company. So, you know, David Shapiro, I hear it on on CNBC adverts all the time. You know, you don't need to be a genius to know what a good company is, and it's very true. Um, you can go into a company and you can dig, you know, to the nth degree, but to make a good investment and find a good company is not difficult. Um, so I've given, I've actually given you guys a little checklist on the side um, with some actual actual metrics. But whenever you look at a company, there's so many different ways of looking at it to try and understand it. Um, you know, okay. So I'll, I'll talk about intrinsic value in a bit, but. Has, has the company got a good track record of revenue and earnings growth? I mean, if, if a company is year after year growing its revenue, you know, it's being able to you know, increase its sales volumes, if, if it's making profits and continuing to increase its profits, that is a good company. Um, does it, does, it, uh, you know, does it have a competitive advantage that will assist it in maintaining higher margins? Does it have that moat? Is it, you know, it, does it have you know, a competitive advantage? You can just look at a business model and understand that. Um, again, Expectations. So I'll, I'll go through the checklist in a second as well. But uh, you know, also manage, your, like not manage your expectations, but understand your expectations of earnings on a company as well. Um, obviously, PE is taken into account where where you know earnings expectations are. So so understand what the rest of the market is thinking. And I mean, look at what other analysts are saying. Listen to to where the market is pricing the stock and why the market is pricing the stock, and then form your own opinion on on trying to understand where it's going or why your opinion would be different. You've got to look at management as well. Uh, obviously, you know, the management is very important. I mean, these are the guys that are looking after your investment. Uh, you need to trust them. They need to have a, a proven track record of delivering, of delivering earnings. Um, does the company reward shareholders? There are plenty of companies that have fantastic management that don't reward shareholders. So look for share buybacks. Look for increasing dividends as well. If they're rewarding shareholders, it's probably going to be a good, a good stock for your portfolio. When do you sell a stock? For us, it's very much there's no smoke without fire. When you start seeing things going wrong inside a company, you'll hear just, just the beginnings uh, of it. That's the time. For us, that's when you, 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 start, you start looking, looking to exit. It's, uh, you, know, you can tell when there are fundamental things wrong with a company, and that's, that's when you, for, for us, that's when we start looking to, to exit it from a portfolio. Again, I've got, given you a checklist. Increasing uh, revenue, increasing earnings, increasing dividends, increasing gross margin, ROE, the yeah, outstanding share base, is it stable or decreasing? Yeah, has the share got a total return uh, over three years of more than 20%? It's just little, little uh, almost quantitative criteria that you can check. It's a bit easier for us in the South African market because you know, we know a lot of these companies. We deal with their products and services every day. <clears throat> we go to a lot of the shareholder meetings for the companies. We, we understand the companies. But once you take money offshore and you're looking at a universe of 85,000 different companies, it becomes very important to have a good quantitative screening model to go and find the type of industries that you want to be able to pick out the, the things that you look for in a company. And this can help. Again, that's why I've sort of given you PE, price to book, price to sales, peg ratio. Put those in a range. Have a range that you're happy to buy in. Um, you know, especially when, you, when you're working with those quantitative screeners, it's, uh, I mean, to, to sort of like tweak it to get the right volume of stocks that you can start doing your bottom-up analysis on um, is very difficult if you don't have one with a little bit of leeway. And because we are more of a, uh, follow a more momentum-driven style, um, I would say that's, you know, the, the valuation ratios are probably where we, to, you know, where we are willing to be a little bit more flexible. Again, understand the, 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 the gearing in, your, in, the, in the investment that you're going to buy as well. Uh, be happy with it in the context of your overall portfolio. You need your solid, stable blue chip stocks, and you need your stocks with a bit of gearing that are going to give you outsized returns as well. 
Um, and again, management quality, absolutely essential. Okay, so now we get on to the stock picks for the evening. Like I said, we, we, we normally put about 20 stocks in the portfolio. Last, last year, you know, our model portfolio actually did 38% in an ungeared market. Again, we were following a momentum strategy. We did shift slightly towards the end, which helped boost it up. We did hold SAB, which helped a lot when our Nasa came out with that deal. I mean, 19% on, on an 8% holding really helps. We also used to have, we still do uh, actually have nice pass as well. But uh, yeah, this is, we've now shifted the strategy a lot. Uh, but these are three stocks that we do, do hold currently. <clears throat> so Adapt IT, uh, this is still for me one of the, the more exciting small cap uh, companies. Uh, again, it fits a lot of our criteria. It's business-to-business uh, -business customers. It's very diversified across the industries that it operates in. I mean, education, manufacturing, financial services, uh, energy. And with, with that, um, you know, obviously Adapt IT, you know, they go in, they actually, they take, you know, all the software solutions, they go in, they tweak it a little bit, so they'll go and get Oracle and SAP and they'll do an implementation for a company, but they'll tweak it slightly so it becomes their Oracle or their SAP implementation. Now, what happens there is, it's very difficult for that company to move. They essentially come in, and I mean, any of you guys that either work in IT or run businesses will understand, once your IT infrastructure is in, to try and change it is an absolute nightmare. You, you just can't. I mean, Standard Bank is struggling with it at the moment, trying to up upgrade systems. It's a very, very difficult thing. They have big partners. I mean, they're in a lot of the big banks as well. They, um, they do the universities. That's the education. <clears throat> they also, I mean, brilliant company. Do they return, do they reward shareholders? I mean, dividend has been increasing dramatically. Headline earnings per share, their compound annual growth rate on headline earnings per share is like plus 25. It's absolutely amazing. Obviously, an IT business is also very geared towards, um, towards acquisitive growth. So, I mean, I don't know if you guys saw EOH obviously buying uh, Aptronics today as well. EOH really sort of, for me, it, it's Adapt IT or EOH in a portfolio. Um, you know, EOH is a little bit more expensive uh, at, the, at the moment, but what really swings it in Adapt IT's favor is that Adapt IT is only, a, you know, it's a 1.72 billion market cap company. It's a lot smaller. When it does deals, um, it's easier for it to do a deal that's going to move the, the needle for, for, you know, for shareholders. Today, Aptronics for, from EOH, great deal, all over sends, everyone wanted to talk about it. I think they paid 194 million for it. EOH is a 20 billion rand company. It's very difficult for them to do earnings accretive deals. Um, again, dividend yield, dividend increasing, and, and the return has been spectacular. I mean, we've been backing this since about six rand. Um, if we go forward, now we just go back to the chart. There we go. Uh, I mean, you can see this thing has had, a, had a stellar run. But the nice thing, because it also sits outside top 40, you know, we did see some volatility around the first quarter, but it's, it's actually been a fairly stable performer because it doesn't, it doesn't get affected. When you start looking at stocks outside of the top 40 index, it doesn't get driven around as much by the macro factors. You've had actually a nice little pullback here. I mean, if you again, I'm doing a little bit of technical analysis here for you as well. Um, it's uh, it's looking like a buy. It's looking very oversold at the moment. Um, you know, just approaching a 200-day moving average there. For me, that's you know flag pendant, flag pendant all the way up. You know, sli slightly sideways and, and starting to move again. I think it's 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 a definite must for 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 any portfolio. Also, yeah, just very very entrenched, a very South African company and one of the South African companies that we look at, uh, but very specific, very targeted exposure into South Africa. Okay. Steinhoff. Now, we've been also backing Steinhoff since about 30, 30 Rand, and we still think it's got an absolutely fantastic uh, future ahead of it. I mean, it's obviously now listed on the, on the Frankfurt Exchange. Um, you look at it compared to its peers, it's still very, very cheap. I mean, you know, it's a, I say you're very cheap, but I mean, a 14 and a half PE is not, not particularly extended. The, the whole company deleveraged ahead of that Frankfurt listing. So they, they came in, they made their, their balance sheet look very good and uh, obviously went listed in Frankfurt. Now, the kicker for me is, obviously, they were raising capital there so that they could really get exposure to the U UK debt markets. We saw today that they were raising uh, a, billion, uh, a billion euro convertible bond. Now, the whole point was to go there, get the gearing down, raise some euros. I mean, most of their businesses in Europe, you know, get their debt denominated in the same uh, place that they operate in and then go and do deals. So already we've started to see the deals coming through. I mean, they made a bid for uh, Home Retail Group, which is Argos. Um, they lost it to Sainsbury's. But again, you, you know, we've got great management in our company. So you've got Marcus Eurster there, and he's not going to overpay. Uh, instead, he turned around. Now they're doing the deal with Darty. They're trying to steal it out from under Fnac's nose. And um, 
yeah, and, and it looks like it's going to go through a nice a nice little addition to them. They're buying it through the Conferama unit, um, which is very sort of, uh, you know, orientated around Paris. Um, and this, and Dartu, it's, a, it's sort of an electronic goods supplier. They've, got, they've also got something called, it's Mr. Goodbye is their website. Um, and they do a lot of like online sales, but it's toasters and shavers and all those electronic goods that, that Steinhoff can, can retail. Um, again, I mean, you know, Brilliant, brilliant management, um, and and I think a must for any portfolio. Uh, you know, again, it gives you nice offshore diversification as well. Um, and and really, I mean, from our point of view, we think that okay, while it's going after Europe at the moment, and, and I think you're going to see a lot of excitement as as the sense announcements come out, as they start doing more and more deals. I mean, this is one that is going to go and take on IKEA in Europe definitely. Um, and then we think, I mean, you know, again, it's a vertically integrated business model, so they actually source a lot in China as well. <clears throat> Once they start understanding that Chinese market, they can very quickly reverse that and, and start retailing in China as well. And when China, you know, in our view, you've got to be bullish on China over five to ten years, when China starts to starts to really develop, when that demographic dividend comes through, I think they'll be well positioned to go in there. They already are starting to understand that market as well. The last thing, I had to actually update this, there's now more analysts covering it. Um, with the listing in Frankfurt, you're getting more and more coverage from the big banks. So we used to have an analyst that went across to Europe to go and see their presentation, what they were doing, go and look at all the different stores. He says, even then, before any coverage, I think they, on the bus, there was BNP Paribas, there was uh, Credit Suisse was there, um, there, was, there was a couple of the big, big fund, I think Goldman's was there as well, starting three years before the listing to go and, go and start understanding the company so when it listed, they could go and, go and initiate coverage. I think there's going to be a lot of excitement already. You, you, Citibank has just, uh, it wasn't today that's uh, old on the slide, but uh, Citibank has just reinitiated coverage. And the more of these banks that start covering it, the more excitement there's going to be around the stock. And I think the, the quicker the, the discount to its peers uh, is going to evaporate. Again, Steinoff, okay, today came out, the convertible bond just pulled down the share price a little bit. I mean, we were looking for levels as well. Um, it's, had a, it's had a fantastic run up. Okay, that's an old Steinoff graph. But, um, yeah, so we're looking at probably an entry at about, uh, you know, 85, 85 Rand to, if, if you can get 80, I think you're doing absolutely fantastically. I mean, we still hold it in portfolios. We definitely wouldn't be selling at these levels. We'd just be accumulating if we get, uh, you know, 5, 5, 5, 10 percent downside from here. Be very happy to accumulate. Uh, we'll definitely be pushing up weightings. Um, now, then, if you also you look at you look at Steinoff over the last couple of years, and like I said, we've, we've been backing this from from sort of sub sub thirty. I mean, you know, again, you look at that compared to the, the all share index. I mean, a massive, massive outperformer. I mean, I think over the last two years, it's about an eighty nine percent performance, and we really see that that continuing as as they gear up for for to go back on the acquisition trail. Okay, and finally, um, an offshore stock pick as well. I uh, love Starbucks as a, as a company. Um, you know, Howard Schultz uh, really, really doing a fantastic job. Uh, again, this, this comes as a company that has one of the higher P's. We're really backing momentum. But, I mean, again, you look at their, their revenue, you look at their operating income, you look at all these things, it's just, it's just absolutely pumping. Uh, another record year for Starbucks. Uh, the thing that we like about it is the stronger dollar is actually helping it because it's, uh, I think, 74% of its sales actually come from within the U.S., um, but also, I mean, technology. Starbucks is, is technologically now delivering you coffee, you know, getting that caffeine fix. It's nice to also have a slightly addictive product. Um, you know, they've got their rewards cards. You can order on your phone before you even walk into the... the, the um, uh, before you can even walk into the, the store. Uh, you can now order, co they're actually looking at coffee deliveries to offices within a certain radius of the, of the, of the store as well. But probably one of the, the most exciting, now what I've always, my investment case behind Starbucks, I mean it's not coffee, it's not driven by coffee price, they hedge their coffee price. What drives Starbucks I think is their brand. I mean it's an incredibly strong brand. Everyone knows Starbucks even though Starbucks isn't even in a country yet. Um, like I said, most of the sales coming from the U.S., but are actively pushing into China now as well. And again, with that, with that, um, you know, demographic dividend coming through. I mean, you know, 2,000 stores now in, in in China. You know, 500 new stores uh, for every every year for the next five years. I mean, this this company is expanding rat rapidly. Um, and yeah, I, I, again, I, you know, I've also just put the, the sell side. I mean, we like to think, you know, what other analysts, what the international analysts are covering. You know, it's, it's difficult in, in the South African context sometimes to, to get, to, you know, a good sell side analyst to come and uh, go through the stock with you. Here, I mean, you've got 29 different analysts covering the company. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, and, and when you've got, what, how many buyers is that? Just 
huge amounts of buys. It's it's definitely. I mean, you can see the target price a lot higher than where it is. This is definitely uh, the kind of stock that you can you can put in the, uh, as one of the cornerstones of your portfolio. If you are a trader as well, I mean, you can even trade it through the IDX products at the JSC. For us, if you are looking for an entry into Starbucks, this is, uh, again, if you go out longer term, it's, again, more flag pennant sort of patterns. But, yeah, you've, you've had a, a short-term downtrend recently, but uh, we've just broken out of that upward channel and it's a pattern we like call the kiss goodbye, which is normally it breaks, uh, you know, that, that uh, resistance line, it breaks through, that becomes support, it comes down, just touches that support kiss goodbye and moves up aggressively off that. So we think, you know, while Steinoff, you might have to wait a little bit for your entry, Starbucks is the kind of company that you can really go out and buy almost immediately. That's it. And that's my presentation. I hope I kept it almost to time. Um, now we can open up for questions. Thanks, Gary. Ladies and gents, we have time for questions. Uh, let's throw a couple out there. Someone somewhere must want to kick us off with a question. Not a soul. Yeah, I always say I don't really buy recovery stocks. I mean, we, we, yeah, I mean, we were discussing it today. I wish I had a board so I could draw, draw on for you. But, I mean, we really back the momentum in stocks. So we would rather miss out on the first little bit of a, a turn in a stock price and wait for the company to, to develop momentum rather than try and guess where the bottom is. And I think that's because my, my background is, is, is trading and derivative trading. So, I mean, we, we always like to see those support lines hold and turn off. And, and the same applies almost fundamentally. You want to see those earnings starting to recover. You want to see the company turn around. You want other people to start getting excited about the company before you get involved. And I don't mind missing out on the first. I'm not, it's, not a, it's not an ego thing for me. I'm not trying to say, oh, I've got it at four rand. Adapt IT, I don't, I don't get it at two rand. That's fine. I don't mind missing out on even 200% you know, as long as I get it when it's in its uh, sort of bull phase. When that breaks down, we'll exit it. Gary, a question that came through in the webcast. Looking at your checklist you put up, that almost says no commodities ever. <laughs> no, I'm, yeah, comf but, I'm comfortable. Yeah, I'm just but, confirming. But it is, yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it does almost say. Yeah, and, and it is. I mean, we, we've, we've been had very spotty. I mean, it just depends. I mean, we, we have Mondi in our portfolio. Do you call it a commodity? Yeah, fair it's, point. It, it's sort of a commodity. I mean, we, we you know. But if last, you go to stuff you dig out of the ground. Yeah, if you go to, we, we very seldom have held that. So, I mean, we held, we held Billiton as the, the best of the worst. And um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it hurts us as well. I mean, Again, I mean, when commodities run, I mean, you know, what we're going through here is the same thing that we went through uh, last year. You, you start looking at your portfolios, you see these commodity stocks running. They're very high beta stocks. Our view at the moment is that you should be de-risking your portfolio. You're now going into very high beta stocks. It's almost doing exactly the opposite of what our investment yeah. philosophy is. Um, and it happened last year as well. Come, come sort of this time, uh, April, commodity prices once again collapsed. I mean, Investec, I wish I'd bought it and put it in. Investec's got a wonderful property clock that they look at. And, and there's, a, there's a cycle, and I mean, that you could look at. And, you know, strategies change as well. But, uh, you know, looking at that, we still see there's two, three years before you're going to get a, a full commodity price recovery. There's still, I mean, you know, you've got the, the likes of Glencore. I mean, they're trying to deleverage. I mean, they're selling off non-core assets. They're canceling dividends. I mean, these are not things that I want to hear from a company that I own, you know. I would rather wait for that to come through the system, miss out on the, on the recovery because we don't know when it's going to be and then, and then buy it uh, when, when it starts to be a good company again. Yeah, that was my comment in December. <laughs> but you, you can't, yeah, again, you can't, you can't, you know, like one, at least it's within my realm of I don't mind buying expensive stocks. But again, I suppose you can't really value, from, from my point of view, you, you don't value it as a, um, you, you know, you don't value it on PE, you value it on asset value, some of the parts. If you look at, I mean, Tencent is a listed company that you can go and you can go and get the exact value it's a very efficient exchange in hong kong hk 700 go and look at it and then you can see you know just just on the basis of that and maybe you should be trading what with the the, uh, the stub and actually trying to make money off it but i mean you're getting 10 cent you're getting everything else nice plus does for free i hate it because every analyst says that but it's a fantastic company i mean it's it's you know i think chris beckett it, maybe it is one great investment, but I mean, they've still got their Facebook stake, they've got Mail.ru, they've got uh, you know, the classified businesses as well, I mean, they've got pay TV, there's a lot that's also in there. And if you just look at it, you have to own it. I mean, you also look at sort of the analyst forecast, I mean, most of them above 3,000, and if that's what the entire sell side is, that's what the fund management community is looking at, you can't not own it. And monster pricing power. Who here cancelled DSTV when the increase went up? Anyone? Please, come on. Some, at least one, not a one. Not a one. That is fantastic pricing power. I'm coming to you, sir, but a question at the back there. Thank you. Your um, 
I found it was um, international property stocks were conspicuous by their absence from your stock picks. Def, definitely, and, and yet we do hold two, and we're getting pummeled on it. So it's probably why it's not in the present day. But, but yeah, we, we hold uh, capital and counties. So Capco, uh, we think I know Capco well, and, uh, and if it's got hammered lately. Yes, yeah, it got absolutely hammered, but I think that's a lot about the concerns around Brexit. If you actually look at that Earl's Court asset and, the, and what they're doing in uh, Covent Garden, we think it's absolutely brilliant. I mean, again, I mean, what they're doing from a development side, you know, and yes, you're getting some pound influence there as well. Again, I think it's, you know, it's getting pounded on the Brexit, what can I say? But it, it's, it's fantastic assets. They, they're centrally placed in London. I mean, I don't know how well you know London. I used to live just down from Earl's Court. Yeah, the, uh, it might have, collapse, but those property prices are going up eventually again, yes. definitely. It's, Would it's you an say it's, city. It's, it's in a buy? At the moment, definitely. Yeah, we're still accumulating. Like, and we've, we've, got, we've got a position in it at the moment. Yes. But we've, we've, had, we've had Capco probably for the last three years I've owned Capco. So, um, yes, I've taken a pounding in the last couple of months, but I look at where my entry price is and it's, it's still you. very, very decent. And sorry, the other international property, we're also still holding Nepi as well. Um, I disagree on one thing. You say the low commodity prices will actually um, help the consumers. Okay. Uh, but my, the reason I disagree is actually because the causal effect is the other way around. The low commodity <laughs> prices is a symptom of a very bad World economy. <laughs> yeah, I, I swear, it, like, is that a Unisa shirt? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, I th it sounds like it. Yeah, yeah, no, but that's it. It's, it's you, you, causality and correlation, you know, there's, there's a whole, you can never draw what causality from a correlation. But I do agree with you, but at the, at the, same, at the same time, if you look at, uh, you know, the collapse in commodity prices, yes, is it because China's demand is slowing? Yes, it is a demand-driven thing for sure. And also, you know, we talk about commodity prices in general. You know, commodity prices is a huge, it's a huge basket of different things and you know I'm probably more leaning towards discussing just oil. Just do your homework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. I've got some inside information. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. But well, what what I'm saying is the like oil markets for example. Like I mean it, I was probably talking more in the context of oil, but base metals as well. But uh, again if you look at if you look at the supply side of a lot of the, the Product, the, the, the commodity price collapse has come from a supply side. You've had Anglo-American ramping up massively, overspending in, in Ministerio. You've had, you know, iron, in the iron ore market, I mean, you've got Roy Hill coming on now. You've got Gina Reinhardt, you know, just, we are going to open these mines. We are going to ship iron ore. We don't care if China's becoming a consumer-driven economy. It's, it, is, it does look like in the, in the peak of the commodity cycle, the, the commodity companies overspent dramatically. So for me, it is also, yes, I agree with you, you know, perhaps the, the you know, the, the, the international consumer is under pressure, but I think a lot of this is coming through from the supply side as well. Basically, I mean, when Harmony started dropping, I mean, surely around that 15 level, as they were coming down, cutting jobs, basically cutting costs, surely there was a lot of value there. Obviously, hindsight now, having a look where it is, but I mean, would you not have looked at commodities down there, commodity stocks? Yeah? We're definitely looking at them. <laughs> but you, I haven't had a we look at your, at your entire portfolio, but I mean, did you not include any of them? No, we, did, we didn't. Because again, I mean, remember, the, the, these commodity prices have been falling for five, six years. And we did, I mean, we did see an acceleration in, in the commodity prices coming off. But I mean, I've, I've seen such wealth destruction on these stocks. I mean, we've had, I've, I've got a client that, that is absolutely a gold bull, spoke to gold bulls, went into harmony, but he was saying exactly what you're saying, but he was saying it at 80, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and he's, like, I mean, the wealth destruction has been spectacular. And uh, I suppose if he holds, yes, the commodity cycle will eventually turn. But if you look at commodity cycles, these are 10, 15 year long um, things and to try and call the bottom for me is dangerous I don't mind not getting harmony at yeah. 15 rand you know but if the momentum turns if there is a stable sort of bull run if there's I don't know Indian demand comes through or, or, or infrastructure in Africa really shows huge promise of, of exploding <coughs> definitely we can start looking at commodities then but for us, it's just it's, it's a sector that too much risk attached. It, it, there's a lot of risk for the for the reward, and I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, we come at it from a stockbroking point of view. I mean, I've got clients that are, like that bought Kumba at 30 rand, yeah, and sure. I was going, oh, I'm not going to buy it. But if you you know, yeah. they say we're going to buy, and I mean, these guys have it's sort of tripled nasty. their accounts. It's been it's been unbelievable for them. For but sure. but uh, I mean, even for a long term kind of perspective, mm -hmm. if you look at say now a low risk share, saying maybe life healthcare for instance, or mm -hmm. be it. Uh, even some of our local property stocks, 
I mean, ultimately, if you hold these commodity prices, uh, commodity stocks, surely in the long term they're going to perform, outperform those safety stocks anyway. Yeah, at, at some point in the cycle, potentially. But but at the same time, I mean, you look at something like Lonman. I mean, like we, we've had clients that, that have been, you know, crushed with Lonman. But then, um, you know, what do you do? And then the, the, the rights issues start, the dilution comes through. And, you know, yes, Lonman share price, when you look at a chart, might have recovered in three or four years' time. But your your value as an investor has been has been destroyed. What's your, what's your expect opinion on two stocks that I have on my portfolio of which <laughs> they are really like killing me? First, uh, Sasol and second one, MTN. I've been holding for quite a while. Should I, <laughs> Should I just sell now? Uh, MTN, one word, smoke. <laughs> Actually, no, two words, blazing fire. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've, I've suffered through that pain with you, I've got to be honest. Like, I mean, like I said, I mean, last, last year we did, we did very well. The three stocks that hurt us were Sassel, MTN, and Billiton. I mean, you know, looking, look, looking at, uh, okay, let's start with Sassel. So Sassel, okay, let's start with MTN. Like, I think, I think Simon's right. I mean, okay, one, both, both of them are oil price stocks. So, I mean, you've both been, been hurt by the oil price. So you can't get away from looking at the oil price. And predicting oil prices is very difficult. But from our point of view, with what's happening, you, you know, in, in the global, I suppose, the, the, the geopolitical dynamics around oil at the moment. I mean, like I said, we've got an OPEC meeting, and whatever I say here, something is going to happen at OPEC that's going to make me look like an idiot. So, so with that, with that qualifier, Russia, Saudi Arabia are going to do a production freeze. Iran, absolutely not interested in slowing down production. U.S. shale. Um, the type, the, the way that shale works is that they can bring that that production on very, very quickly. So there's about, you know, if you look at it, I mean, okay, Iran ramping up massively, but there's still, if, if oil goes back to between 45 and $50 a barrel, there's another half a billion barrels a day coming out of the US that's going to become viable again, and it will come back on stream very, very quickly. So, you know, unless you're going to have Saudi properly cutting back production, which I Personally, I don't see it. I don't see you know, with with the situation they've got domestically. I don't see that happening. I don't see an oil price going back to eighty, a hundred dollars a barrel. I think we're going to be hovering down here for a while, and how how long I don't know because you know there's substitute technologies that are coming in as well. Ten years time, you're going to be driving electric cars, in my opinion, and it's you know oil. I don't, I don't know. Maybe you know it's difficult to forecast anything more than three years out, especially economically. But so both of your stocks are very tied to oil, which I think is is perhaps a concern for us. I think you know twenty seven dollars a barrel oil is way too cheap. Uh, but at forty three, forty four, I think it's starting to look pretty expensive. And I mean, already it was FT and Standard Bank this morning came out saying that. Um, if we don't get a production freeze on Sunday, this oil price is coming down aggressively because it's already priced in the entire quantum. Um, you know, looking at MTN specifically, I think, you know, the, I mean, we all, all have been complaining about the shareholder communication there, but, uh, you know, I think it's, it's very difficult. There's a lot of uncertainty on the stock at the moment. So we, we do, you know, I say, like, it's probably the, the least, my least favorite stock in our, in our current portfolio. And I mean, and that's actually Vodacom. <laughs> and I mean, because we've switched, we've, we, we like telecom exposure, but we've switched MTN for Vodacom. We, we switched it a while back. Um, it was before, yeah, I mean, and there's been huge volatility. I think we switched out at about 140 and some days it looks like a good decision. Some days it looks like a bad decision. But uh, with Vodacom's dividend yield at the moment, I mean, it also forms uh, you know, almost targeted exposure to South, the South African market. And we think we think it's fairly entrenched there. So, I mean, yeah, I think they've got some pricing power because I don't think Celsius is going to do anything, and I think, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's it, it's a very it's a very difficult call because we don't know what the the Nigerian government is going to do. I mean, the last I heard that the fine is going to be increased back to fifteen billion. I mean, it's like now we're going to take your entire market cap for the whole group and we're going to fine you that. I mean, it's just it's insane what's coming out there. So I mean, I feel sorry for for the. I mean, Simon's also very critical of the, their shareholder communication, and it's. But I feel very sorry for them because you know every day there seems to be the people that they they they're trying to report. I mean, they can't report some of the stuff that that that's getting said. So yeah, I think. I think a difficult one, but Sassel, again, also a, a great company, but a great company that's that's you know very well run. And I mean, the programs that they're putting into to manage the the lower oil price is very good. They have been helped also by the the weakening currency because they're also a currency head stock. Sassel for us, it's it's a it's a lovely stock to range trade. So we're doing a lot of range trading. So I mean, we get down to you know 400, 380. We'll probably be buying Sassel, but you're getting up to sort of 450 to 500 reselling Sassel. So it's it's one that we're playing more on the short term derivative side. If I can take a last question, then we have to yeah, you sir. 
you know, we, we missed on it because we also do a lot of short-term derivative trade. We were waiting for 340 and it got there. We just didn't, pay, we just didn't pull the trigger. So I'm also like, I think, you know, fair value, Investic's got a fair value. We, we chat a lot to one of their sell side analysts there. Um, they've got a fair value at 370. They like, the, I mean, the thesis there is that, uh, you know, the, some of the parts of that, the, the food services business and the, uh, what's going to be a bit of industrial with Africa businesses rolled into it. Um, you know that's that's 370, and at the moment trading anything below that, it's, it should be a, it should be a buy because there will be value unlock when the when the two businesses split and unbundle. Um, that's it. It's difficult to price because we don't know what the market's going to price each of the individual, well, like bid corp and and the, the remaining bidders. We don't know how the market's going to price it, but we we're probably looking at uh, you know the, the 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 food services business on a twenty times multiple if you compare it to its peers. So the, you know, but again, you don't know where that's going to trade. So that for us, if if that is trading at a twenty times um, twenty times earnings, the you know the rest of the assets are, are just so undervalued that you've got to buy it. As soon as that splits, I think it's going to split when it's in of May, I think it's going to come out, yeah. So that, uh, when that splits, I mean, the market's obviously going to assign a price to it, and then we can make a decision. Um, you know, Joffe management, it's, it's still, we like both businesses, but um, it'll come down there, it will come down to evaluation as to which one we hold. You should you should get two shares, yeah. It'll be two shares, I think you get one of each. So it'll just be, you've got a hundred of Bidvest, you now get a hundred of each. Yeah. Ladies and gents, I'm going to leave it there. We're hitting time. I know their questions. Come harass them. Come contact them on the website and the like. Gary, really appreciate it. like the stock picks. I, none of them are mine, but I can live with that. Uh, well, one of them is my, uh, Steinhoff's in my momentum portfolio. Uh, ladies and gents, we are back in Joburg, 2nd of June. Keith McLaughlin uh, talking small caps. We will be in Cape Town late May. You can catch the webcast. But my thanks to the JC for the event. My thanks to Gary and his team. And my thanks to all of you for coming through the Sunton traffic. Thanks all. Cheers. Good night.